God wants you to have peace. Not just circumstantial peace. Not just peace that the pandemic's getting better. But God wants you to have that residing peace in your heart. That confidence that Almighty God has His hand on your life. And no matter what comes, no matter what happens, that He has you in His hand. Bibles and open them up to the Gospel of John in chapter 20. If you're joining us for the first time today in several weeks, a few weeks ago, the week right after Easter, we began a series of messages entitled 50 Days. And we're looking at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples and others during those 50 days. Now, there were a lot of appearances, a lot of revelations. But the Gospels and Acts only record six. And I have to believe that there's a significance in those six. That Jesus was saying something very poignant to his disciples, but he's also creating a message for those of us that would come in future generations. So, We've looked at his first appearance on Easter afternoon, eyes wide open. And we've looked at the road to Emmaus as he revealed himself to those disciples on that day. Today, we're going to look at a very familiar story and one that has already kind of been painted for us by the worship arts ministry. I want to begin reading in verse 19. John writes and says, When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. And the disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I also send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, which means a twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I shall see his hands and the imprints of the nails, put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, after eight days again, his disciples were inside, and this time Thomas was with them. Jesus came. The doors having been shut. And that word literally means locked. He stood in their midst, and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger, and see my hands, and Reach here your sand, hand and put it into my side. And be not unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Now many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. 
But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. God bless the reading of his word. It was 1873 that famed hymn writer Fanny Crosby was visiting a dear friend by the name of Phoebe Knapps. Phoebe was actually having a pipe organ installed in her home that day. And Fanny wanted to hear some notes from that pipe organ. However, after the installation was complete, Phoebe didn't play the pipe organ. She went over to the piano and she said, Fanny, I want to play a new tune that's come to my mind. And she played the tune, and then she looked at Fanny, who was blind from almost birth. And she said to her, Fanny, what is that tune saying to you? And without hesitation, Fanny Crosby replied and says, it says, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. In less than one hour, that beautiful hymn was finished. It was published later that year, and well, the rest is history. You know, the Bible says a whole lot about assurance and trust and faith and doubt. The Bible calls us to trust the Lord, even in the most difficult situations, not just when we're on the mountaintop, not just when we can see clearly what God is doing, not when we we sense God all around us, not when we're surrounded by multitudes of other friends of faith, but even in the darkest hours, God says, don't doubt me, have peace. Moses rebuked the Israelites at the Sea of Galilee because they doubted God after he had led them out of Egypt with a high and mighty hand. Ten miracles that were nationwide that no doubt showed the power and the will of God and the love and compassion of God for his people. And yet they got to the edge of the Red Sea and... <clears throat> I'm not going to be one of their critics today because if I'd have been in their midst that day, if I'd been in their shoes, I might have had the same doubt. But they asked the question, why did you bring us out of Egypt? To bring us here to the shore of the Red Sea to be slaughtered by Pharaoh? And Moses rebuked them and said, stand back. Stand back and see the hand of God. Jesus rebuked the disciples in the boat on the Sea of Galilee when the storm rose. And they were afraid that the boat would capsize. It would be torn apart by the waves. And they would sink and die, drown. Jesus was asleep in the bottom of the boat and they woke him up and even chided the Lord and said, don't you care about us? We're going to drown? You're down there sleeping? Jesus rebuked them for doubting. He said, oh, you of little faith. And he spoke to the storm and the winds and the waves and quieted the storm. James tells us in the letter of James that if we pray doubting, we're just like the surf on the beach being driven and thrown about every which way by every kind of wind that blows. This message today is a clarion call to you and to me to have no doubt. Have no doubt. Trust. Have confidence. Place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's easy to fear. It's easy to fear when circumstances turn bad. 
It's easy to fear when we're sick. It's easy to fear when we're in uncharted waters like we're in right now. And I'm telling you, have no doubt. Have no doubt. God's got this. And God's in control. Now I want to give you a little background on this, on this text today because John, John gives us the timeline. The, the passage that we read, beginning in verse 19 through 31, actually covers three different periods. The first five verses of this text is still on Easter afternoon. It's that other passage we read in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus appears to those disciples on the day of resurrection and he reveals himself to them. But John notes that on that particular afternoon, Thomas was not there. We don't know where he was, but he wasn't with them. And then the next verses that follow that describe the period of time during the next week where the disciples are, they found Thomas and they're, they're telling Thomas, we have seen the Lord. He has risen. And Thomas makes that famous statement. Unless I see the scars in his hand and I place my finger in the, in, in, in the scars of his hand and place my, my hand in his side, I will not believe. What outrageous doubt. But then in the last part of this passage, John tells us it's eight days later. So if I'm counting, I'm going to say it's the next Sunday. And on that eighth day, the disciples are gathered together again, probably in a, a common home, a common meeting place, and they're still frightened. They're still afraid. They've got the doors shut and locked. And Jesus appears again, and he meets Thomas. And this appearance, this appearance, not only is for Thomas's benefit, it's for your benefit. It's for my benefit right now, here today, 2020. And the message is clear. Have no doubt. Now, I want us to look at this Thomas, the apostle. Thomas, doubting Thomas, he's been labeled, really is every man's story. Every one of us, at some point, at some time in our life, I would dare say, could fit Thomas's shoes perfectly. Frankly, I, I kind of think Thomas has gotten a little bit of a bad rap down throughout history. Thomas was a faithful disciple. In fact, it even referred to this on the video that you saw in John chapter 11. Jesus is called to go to Bethany because Lazarus is sick and even dying. And Jesus delays his going until Lazarus can die so that he can show them that he's the resurrection and and the life. But this is right before Passover. Tensions have never been higher. Conspiracies to capture Jesus and bring him to trial and put him to death are all over Jerusalem. And the disciples said, Lord, Bethany's only two miles from Jerusalem. You, you, this is, that's a hotbed of danger. And it was Thomas who spoke up. And said, let's go with Jerusalem, let's go with him to Bethany and to Jerusalem and die with him if need be. He was ready to put his life on the line with the Lord Jesus Christ. It was Thomas in John chapter 14 when Jesus was trying to, trying to tell the disciples that he was about to leave them. He was, he was going to die. It was Thomas who had the boldness to speak up about the confusion that all the disciples had and said, Lord, how can we know the way? We don't know where you're going. What happened to Thomas? History tells us that the disciple Thomas became an apostle missionary into India and ultimately gave his life 
for the gospel's sake in India. He was martyred in India. Today, whether it's historically accurate or not, but there is a tomb supposedly containing the body of the apostle Thomas. But the fact that he was a missionary carrying the gospel after Pentecost is pretty well founded. Thomas was a faithful disciple. And, and, and he, he illustrates to us that every one of us who trusts Jesus, who loved you, he loved the Lord. But he was caught. He was caught in a moment of unbelief. He was caught in a moment of doubt. And he wanted proof positive. Just like all the other disciples. They, they got to see... They got to eat with the Lord. They got to shake his hand. Thomas wanted that same proof positive. Let me ask you a question this morning. Has there ever, ever been a time in your life where you've doubted God's presence? You've doubted God's power? You've got, doubted God's care and concern? For you that maybe he didn't really even know where you were or what you were going through or if he did he didn't care there ever been a time in your life where you have doubted God's promise of eternal life I dare say we've all been there at some point for some period of time Thomas to me exemplifies every man we find our play ourselves in that place of doubt and God says I don't want you to doubt I want you to have the peace of confidence we go back to our text and on both days both the first day of the resurrection that afternoon when Jesus appeared to the disciples and and Thomas wasn't there and then on the eighth day the next Sunday when Thomas was with the disciples, both times Jesus comes into their presence and the very first thing he says is peace. Peace, don't be afraid. I want you to know today, God wants you to have peace. Not just circumstantial peace, not just peace that the pandemic's getting better, but God wants you to have that residing peace in your heart, that confidence that Almighty God has His hand on your life, and no matter what comes, no matter what happens, that He has you in His hand. There's going to there's gonna come a day when you and I will get sick, and we won't get well on this earth. There's going to come circumstances in your life where we're going to lose material goods. There's going to come a time in your life when somebody is going to betray you. A family member, a close friend. And in that moment, in those times, I want you to remember Jesus saying, Peace. Don't be afraid. I'm here. He wants us to have that confidence, that peace, that confidence brings in our life. And so, so Jesus comes in and, and he does the same thing both times, both on the Sunday afternoon of the resurrection and, and, and eight days later on the next Sunday, he comes in and he shows himself. He reveals that majesty of the resurrection his glorified body i think i mentioned this last week but i i forget sometimes where i've said things but one of the things that we see jesus never do after the resurrection was walk into a room and john underlines that for us in this passage you can't you can't see it in the english as well but in both places both in, in verse 19 and later again in verse 26, John, uh, John uses 
or the translation is the word shut. But the word that John uses means more than just being kind of closed. It's translated shut tightly or it locked. These doors were secured. These disciples were afraid. They were afraid the Jews were going to come pounding or the Roman soldiers were going to come pounding on their door any moment and say, you are his disciples. You come with us. You're going to taste the same bitter fruit that he tasted. So they were huddled in fear. The doors were secured. And suddenly Jesus just stood in their midst. I want to tell you, Maybe I'm weird, but the reality of the resurrection, the power of that resurrection, the promise of that glorified body is so exciting to me. To know that God is certainly not done with us here in this life. And even if I die today, I'm going to be in the presence of Christ, but God's still not done with me yet. He's got something even better, even more complete in the future. I'm going to get a body like Jesus had on that Easter Sunday. Not only that, Jesus brings with him the power of authenticity. Again, in both cases, on both days, Jesus tells the disciples, and in the second week, he tells Thomas, look, see, touch. You remember last week, he even said, hey, you got something to eat around here? And they gave him a fish, and he ate it. In front of them. Now, I've created controversy because I said last week, that's proof that we're going to get to eat in heaven, and I know Bluebell will be there. And some of you said, Pastor, I don't think. Well, okay, you can be wrong if you want to. I think we will. He didn't have to eat. He didn't need to eat, but he ate. He ate the fish. But here's the thing I'm trying to say is that we have a Lord, we have a Savior who is authentic. He's historical. He's material. He's real. The whole purpose of all four of these evangelists were to show that Jesus wasn't just some saga. He wasn't just some legend. He wasn't just some story that was told to prove some kind of moral or spiritual truth. He actually, factually came out of that grave and he went out of his way to show that to his disciples, begging them, entreating them, shake my hand, feel my scars, give me something to eat. He wanted them to know that authenticity. And I want to say this to you, especially Maybe if you're watching this morning, and maybe you're not even sure, you know, about faith in Jesus Christ, your relationship with God, I want to tell you, listen to God speak this morning. Don't, Don't worry about what I'm saying. You listen to God speak this morning. God's Word says, I have gone out of my way to show you the historical, actual factual authenticity of the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. He's not just a story. He's a real person seen by hundreds of witnesses after the resurrection. And so Jesus calls us. He called Thomas to trust me. I mean, why in the world would we not We sit here and we see Jesus die a cruel death on a cross. And then three days later, he appears in the room. And he says, hug me, shake my hand. Feel the scars. Why would we not trust a God like that? Why would we not trust a God who says, I will never leave you? Why will we trust Why would we not trust a God who says, there's no reason to doubt I'm here? And so he calls Thomas to trust him. He says, reach out 
here, touch these scars, feel my wound in my side. And he said, be not unbelieving, but believing. Now let me say this again. The word faith is an interesting word. It's the word pistis in the New Testament. And most often, it's used as a verb, not a noun. It's not just a set of isms that we ought to intellectually believe. That's not faith. Faith is action. It's commitment. And Jesus looks at Thomas, and he uses that same word, but he has a prefix on it, an A. Be not unbelieving. And the Greek word there is the word apistos. Whenever you see an A on the front of a word like that, it means a negative. Don't be unbelieving. Don't be uncommitting, Thomas. But believe. Believe me. Take that step of faith. Thomas already believed Jesus was the Lord. This wasn't an issue that whether he was a follower of Christ or not a follower of Christ. Here was a disciple, one who had followed Jesus to the end willing even at one point to give his life for the Lord. But now he was shrugging. Now he was shrinking back. Now he was cowering. And Jesus said, have confidence. Have confidence in me. Well, all of this leads to something that's very significant for you and me today. It's evidence. Evidence of the sacrifice of Christ, evidence of the death of Christ, evidence of the resurrection of Christ, but it's evidence that calls for a verdict in every one of our hearts. It's interesting what John adds on. It almost sounds like John's signing off on the gospel. We know he doesn't. There's some other reports that he gets that we're going to look at in the next few weeks, but it's interesting what he says in verses 30 and 31. Listen to this. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. We don't have the full account. We don't have the full report. A lot of other appearances, a lot of other meetings. But he says, These have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing, you may have life in his name. You know, Thomas's faith, again, we we criticize Thomas as the doubting Thomas. Oh, my goodness, how could he possibly do that? Again, Go back 2,000 years, put yourself in his shoes, and we could very well have done the same thing. But I want you to understand, Thomas's faith was not blemished by the need for sight. But it was privileged. Others saw Jesus. In fact, Paul tells us in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, over 500 eyewitnesses saw the resurrected Christ. Hundreds, hundreds saw the body of Jesus walking around, talking after they had seen him die on the cross. However, that number is minuscule compared to the number of eyes that did not get to see and have not seen the resurrected Christ. The hundreds of millions, maybe billions of people that have walked through the pages of history since 2,000 years ago, have not seen the resurrected body of Christ. I have not. You have not. And Jesus looks at Thomas, and he says, Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. He's talking about everyone who didn't have the privilege 
of seeing the resurrected body of Christ. However, John follows that up by saying, God has given us every reason. He's given us, us ample reason to believe and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ by the signs that Jesus did, by even the signs that weren't even recorded. And Jesus said, John said, that if we place that faith in Him, no doubt, no doubt, we have everlasting life with Him.